mailbag. That's the nothing personal word of the day for this final show of 2023. It has been, we started going live January 1st, 2nd, 3rd, or 4th of 2023. You've been with us right through the year. So I wanted to take this final episode. We'll be back live on Tuesday, 8 a.m. sharp on Nothing Personal with David Sampson. I wanted to take an opportunity to answer some of your questions and to follow up on some things that have happened throughout the year, maybe even some top 10 lists of movies and TV shows. So davidsampsonpodcast.com, that's how to reach us. You can ask questions also on Twitter at David P. Sampson. And we love interacting with you. Coca interacts, I interact, it's great. You have great ideas for movies and TV shows and, and topics and your thoughts on the topics. I value all of them. When we started Nothing Personal four years ago, it was October of 19, we wanted to bring you 45 minutes a day of truth, of my truth, of the truth, get you inside the kimono, what's happening in the world of sports and business and culture and entertainment. And we want it to be a little different, not just finding topics to yell about and be a gas bag, but to give you thoughtful opinions where you can make your own educated guess or thought or believe what you want to believe, but at least hear from every side. So one of the things that we do with our wait to seize as an example is we follow up. Follow up is so important. And in this world, and I don't want to in any way speak ill of our industry because I'm honored to be a part of it and honored to have the platform, but follow up is not in the forte of many people. And the reason I love doing it is credibility. I want you to know that I still think about things. And when I tell you things, if I don't do them or they're not happening the way I thought, we'll revisit it. So going into last year, well, it's still this year, but going into 2023, I gave you a list of New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions are interesting. You forget about them as soon as you make them. You rationalize away the fact that you don't do them. And then you start again every New Year's Eve saying this year is going to be different. I'm going to get in shape. That's a familiar one. I'm going to eat better. I'm gonna work harder and smarter, a better father, a better spouse or boyfriend, a better person, a better friend. No one does a New Year's resolution. I used to joke in baseball that my New Year's resolution was gonna to be to drink more because the team would cause me to do that. Who would ever have a New Year's resolution like that? But I wanna go through what my eight resolutions were and how I did. And I'm not proud of this, but here we go. I have an apartment in New York City and I've got light bulbs in the ceiling and it's dark and they don't work well. And I told you that I was going to change my light fixtures in my apartment. I had one year to do it and I did not. That's a no. And then I said, I'm gonna be all smart in addition to watching a movie every day and TV series, there's been such great content that I'm gonna read five books and I even named them the Nazi conspiracy, the snows of Mount Kilimanjaro in cold blood. I wanted to read them all. I read the Nazi conspiracy. That's it. One book in a year. It's enough to make Coca crazy. He's such a voracious, amazing reader. Coca read 44 books this year and I did not read five. I read one. Now it doesn't mean I don't read. I read every day, but when I'm not reading and preparing for a show, I like watching but I gotta read more. New Year's resolution. Eh, we'll see if that's gonna be part of 24. Number three, I told you I wanted to play pickleball for the first time. Guess what? Went to Florida for Michael Hill's wedding and the day of the wedding, went to play pickleball. And I had totally forgotten it was a New Year's resolution until I went through this list again and realized that I did it. And I am now an addict of pickleball. It is so much fun. I strongly encourage. I don't think it's an exclusive sport. I think that there's pickleball courts, public ones everywhere. Play pickleball. I did. My fourth New Year's resolution. I said I wanted to change someone's life. It's sort of a bizarre resolution as I look back on it, but I certainly did try during the course of this year to do things for people as much as I could, strangers, people who I know, friends, family. There's somebody who I met online, they contacted us as a fan of nothing personal. And they said something to me in Coca that I believe counts as having changed someone's life. 
They talked about the troubles they were having, the troubles at home, health issues. And they talked to me and Coca about how nothing personal was a constant. And that's one thing that's true. 8 a.m., we've done more shows. I don't even know who does as many shows. We don't like taking days off because we value consistency and quality. And so this person told us that he felt like a different person because of what Nothing Personal has meant for him and the fact that I'm in his ear and on his screen every day to start his day 8 a.m. sharp. So I'm gonna take a yes on that. My next year's resolution was that I would go 14 days without sugar. No chance toilet pants. I'm pretty sure I didn't go one day without sugar. As you know, I am a candy addict. Wait till you see, I should have brought up for this taping, Coca, what I have in my bag to carry on the plane for this trip I'm taking. And uh, I eat candy every day. I don't think I went, even when I'm sick, I eat candy. And I seem to get sick every June and December, which is sort of bizarre because here's another little nugget about me. I keep track of whenever I'm sick. I put it in my calendar as DPS dash sick so I can calculate how many days a year I am sick. And to be sick, it means I can't do a show or if I do a show, I'm sweating and shivering or I'm just cannot get out of bed. But I did not go 14 days without sugar. That New Year's resolution went right to the crapper. Number six, reconnect with an old friend. I don't know if you're listening to this, Mickey Bergeron, but I reconnected with you. We went to high school together. We had a reunion. You were there, I was there. We looked at each other and said, oh, hello, old friend. And we've been in touch pretty consistently ever since. So I did reconnect with an old friend. My next one is disconnect for an entire weekend. This one really actually makes me upset. I said that I would go a weekend without this appendage that I have, this phone that truly is with me at all times, day and night. Maybe it stops me from sleeping, but I'm addicted to my phone. I'm addicted to the things I do on my phone. I never look at screen time because I don't want to be depressed. That said, I was not able to disconnect for an entire weekend, not because I was jonesing, because I had this false feeling that if I weren't on my phone and something happened, I'd be late getting the news to you or I'd be late tweeting about it or doing a episode or not prepared for Monday's episode where I spend all weekend calling down all the things that happened to do a Monday show. So I felt like I can't disconnect for a weekend. I'm way too important, which is absolute horse hockey. I'm quite disappointed in myself for not having done that. And the last New Year's resolution, keep nothing personal going. And we did because of you. So out of eight New Year's resolutions, one, two, three, four yeses, four noes. I guess when you bat 500, you're in the Hall of Fame. But for me, New Year's resolutions, four out of eight, quite unacceptable. So I'm gonna try to do better this year. So I wanna go through my New Year's resolutions for 2024. Number one, finish the London Marathon. I am starting to train after the new year for the London Marathon. I was supposed to start two weeks ago and didn't because I'm lazy having done the 48 mile, 48 hour challenge that I did in September. So I've given my body a break, but I'm starting to train after the new year and I will finish the London Marathon. I guarantee that's sort of the fix is in because I will not quit the way I did in Berlin. I can tell you that. Number two, spend one full day with each of my three children. I've been thinking a lot about the passage of time and the, the, the loss that we all have and the deaths that happen in families, the end of runs. And I can't take back the way I was a father during their childhood. They're now 28, 25, and 20. I can't take it back that I chose work and chose to, uh, I always chose work. I tried to go to Little League games and recitals, but I'd have my phone attached to me because God knows if a trade's happening or something's going on in the baseball world, I had to be a part of it. And it's not that I regret it because I made the choice consciously every day. That said, my relationship with my kids has gotten better and better each day because I make a bigger effort to make it so. 
and I don't want to stop that. And I think the next stage in that is spending a full day with each of them. I hope they agree to it, though their lives are so busy, and that makes me proud that they're doing their own thing, they have their own lives. But I'm hopeful that I will get to spend just one full day with each of my three children. I'm gonna bring back the disconnect for an entire weekend, and I'm gonna bring it back. I'm gonna try to go phone free for a weekend. Will I do it? Maybe I'll do it right the first week of January. Just get it out of the way. That's a New Year's resolution. Next, I wanna climb a 14er in Colorado. A 14er is a 14,000 foot mountain. There are a bunch of them in Colorado. And a very good friend of mine, his name is Javier Soto, suffered a terrible loss with the passing of his daughter when she was just a child. And in her honor, he raises money each year since, so it's been twice, that he's climbed a 14er and raised money for charity. I've donated, but I've never done the climb with him. This summer, I plan to do the climb with him. Javier, I'm committed to you, committed to that, committing to continuing the memory of Sophia, your beautiful daughter. So my resolution is to climb a 14er in Colorado. Next, this one's tougher. I'm not sure I can do this. I'm committing to weighing myself fewer than four times per day. I have a body dysmorphia issue. I do believe I am overweight. I am focused constantly on covering my stomach and looking in the mirror and looking at my neck and weighing myself before and after I go to the bathroom. I am in therapy over that. I am hoping to get better. It is not healthy what I do. I can calculate and I try to imagine how much a bathroom stop is going to help me, how much weight I lose per night when I am sleeping those two hours I sleep, but I gotta try. So I'm gonna try to weigh myself fewer than four times per day. Right now it's way more than four. So if I can get down to three, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, that would be an improvement. So we'll see how that goes. I'm going to try to go vegan for one month. That sort of coincides with the weighing myself and trying to get healthier and lose some weight, working out more and better and smarter. Going vegan for a month is hard for me because if it breathes, I like eating it. I don't eat pork actually but I love everything about eggs and cheese and meat. But going vegan is something that it just takes discipline and I am always testing my discipline. So I'm gonna try to go vegan for one month. My next New Year's resolution and eighth is to read two books. That's my seventh actually, just two books. Not five, just two. Can you do it, David? You got enough plane rides, but I like watching movies on planes. You have enough nights when you're not sleeping, but I like watching movies when I'm not sleeping. Two books, David, that's one every six months. Come on. And my last New Year's resolution, just like the others, is to keep nothing personal going. Those are my New Year's resolutions for the year. My IFB, what's wrong with it? Where is it, behind me? What are you asking me to do? Better now? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Johnny, can you hear me? We're gonna keep nothing personal going. Coca, Metal Arc, Samson, it's quite a team. Well, at least it's two thirds of a team. So happy new year, everybody. I hope that when you make your resolutions, you reflect on your past year and what this next year has, because I promise you it will be different than what you think. It'll be harder, it'll be easier, they'll be laughing, they'll be crying, there'll be loss but I hope above all that there is growth. Happy New Year, everyone. Okay, how about this is a mailbag question? I'm loving this, Coca. Hi, David. I love when all questions start with hi, David, or hello, David, or some sort of derivative of that, because it makes me feel like I know you, because you feel like you know me, because you see me. I feel like I know people based on Twitter and engagement and stuff, but we don't really know each other. But when you say hi, that's sort of like knowing. Hi, David. Why are some franchises so successful and some are such failures? Is there a secret sauce? I've held off on answering this question for quite a bit because it requires an amount of self-reflection that is difficult to do. Because one could argue that I had tremendous success running a franchise and tremendous failures. And I've been thinking a lot about what I did or what happened that would cause a franchise like the one I worked for to be successful or not. 
And it occurs to me that we need to define our terms. If your definition of success is winning the title, that means in baseball, only one out of 30 teams is successful per year. So that can't be the sole definition. If your definition of success is that according to Forbes, your team is worth more at the end of the year than it was at the beginning of the year, is that the definition? Is your definition of success p &L, The team makes money and doesn't lose money. Is it that you find players that other people don't want and you make them better? Is it that you put your employees in a position to succeed in whatever department they're in, marketing, sales, finance, human resources, where as a leader of an organization, you try as hard as you can to operate in a world where doing one thing for one person helps them, but actually hurts someone else. Hey, players, could you please make more appearances for our sales team? Hey, baseball department, I'm sorry, the players are gonna be tired and grumpy. Hey, marketing, you thought that we were gonna spend more money on buys and on engagement, but it turns out we're pouring that money into a utility infielder. You have to define the parameters of your success. I gave a speech about this one time, Coca. I've talked about this on Nothing Personal, the commencement speech I gave, where people's definition of success is totally different. And therefore, the most important thing is to know what your definition is, and then have self-awareness to actually evaluate whether you were successful. So the way I want to answer this question about why some franchises are successful and some are failures, I'm going to define success and failure as attaining the goals that are reasonable and measurable that you set out for yourself and your company in the beginning of the fiscal year, and then deciding and figuring out whether you attain them at the end of the fiscal year. Fiscal year is for business. Many companies have calendar years, their fiscal year, but some don't. We used to have November 1 to October 31 as our fiscal year, because October 31 was the last payments that we would make uh, to players. But many companies have January 1 to December 31, doesn't matter. Whatever your, your year is, you can measure it, whatever you want. But to know whether or not you're successful, it's like garbage in, garbage out when it comes to information. If you hear something from someone and tell somebody else that the thing you heard is true, but the thing you heard was not true, but the thing you told was perceived to be true, so now you've got multi layers of people thinking that something's true that's not. That's how I look at success with franchises. I, when we started a year, would measure success the following ways. Do we stick to our budget? Are there any downside surprises that make us not hit our revenue numbers or that we went over on our expense numbers? Did we provide an atmosphere for employees to succeed? And that means in doing their job. I'd love there to be a fun atmosphere. I think if you speak to people who worked with me, we worked hard and we played hard. But the focus on that is, are people able to do their jobs? Do you let people do their jobs? That was one of the things that would measure a successful franchise. Wins and losses. That's an easy one. Win a World Series, finish over 500, finish within a wild card, within a few games of a wild card. Before a season, I would try to make a goal for our team that was reasonable. I'll tell you in 2013, I didn't set a goal of winning 90 games, but I sure as hell was a failure because I didn't think that we'd lose 100 games, even after that big trade. So each year you set a goal for yourself. Do you hit it? You're successful. Do you not? You're a failure. The next type of goal that you should have in a company is are you forward facing? Because if you are stagnant, you are failing. So what provisions, what provisos, what goals do you have for your company? What long-term projects? A question I had in a mailbag maybe a year or two ago was about short, mid and long-term goals or projects. And I told you that I've got all three and I'm constantly moving them through the pipeline because long-term goals become short-term goals when the long-term deadline is upon you. It's no longer long-term. And I like having short, mid and long-term things on my agenda in my head. And so before every year, I would set short, mid and long-term goals. 
and I would measure my success as a franchise is did I attain all the short-term goals? Did the midterm goals get moved to short-term and get taken care of? And what did I do with my long-term? Did something change in the company? Some sort of IT advance, some sort of marketing initiative, some sort of capital project with the ballpark. Something that I wanted to accomplish, if you set it and do it, you're successful. And the last thing that I did going into a year is I had personal goals. Because having goals only professional, it's, it's not good enough for me. And granted, I chose professional over personal many, many times cost me a family. But that said, it's always ideal to set professional and personal goals and figure out how you can attain both. And my philosophy has long been, you cannot excel professionally and excel personally. There is no person that has the bandwidth to be both. But if you want to be the best father you can be, it is very difficult to be the best president you can be. If you want to be the best president you can be, it's hard to be the best father that you want to be. When you set a goal to be the best at both, you are violating my number one principle of goals, which is they have to be attainable. Because if you're setting yourself up for failure, that's a mistake you're making. And that causes you to change your behavior, to alter your mechanisms, thinking that you can attain that rabbit as the chasing dog. And the whole point of the rabbit is the dogs never catch it. So why are some franchises so successful and some failures? Because they don't set the right goals. Okay. Can I do this one? This was an interesting question someone had for me. All right, I'm gonna do it. What do I care? What is the single greatest, you didn't say hello to me though. Hello, even though there's no hello in this question. What is the single greatest opportunity you see that Meadowlark Media is missing out on? How has Dan's lack of business acumen he needs hurt the company in your eyes? I appreciate your honest candor. Well, Coca, I don't wanna sacrifice your position. However, I'm gonna answer this question. I've been a part of Metal Arc now. When, when do we join, Coca? I can't remember. Was it March of 2023? Does that sound right to you? Was that our first day in the show? Last week of March is when we did. So we've only been there from four to 12, eight months, two thirds of a year. That can't be April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, nine months, three quarters of a year. Let me give you the background for how I'm answering this question. I've had a relationship with Dan Levitard since I got to Florida in 2002. Our relationship has had many ups, many downs. It has been an interesting road that we have walked together on air and off air. Many of you ask about the on air shenanigans that take place with Metal Arc. Many of you wonder why they treat me the way they do on air. Is it real? Is it a bit? Is it not? I leave that up to you. When I joined Metal Arc, which means I license nothing personal to Metal Arc, so Metal Arc monetizes nothing personal, but I still own uh, nothing personal. Dan had told me about Metal Arc. He told me what his goals were for the company. They've got two sides to their company, the Dan Lebitard Show with Stu Gotts and other podcasts like Pablo Torre Finds Out, like Oddball. Then they've got another side, which is the scripted and unscripted business that John Skipper focuses on quite a bit, where they're developing shows, developing podcasts like Sports Explains the World, which is amazing, doing scripted series or unscripted series, features, documentaries, and the pipeline is very full in Metal Arc. Dan's show is a rousing success. The partnership that they have with DraftKings, it is a profitable partnership for both sides. Dan takes his platform, which is huge, very seriously. And it is very hard to do a show like his because it's not just a sports show. It's a zany show. It's a show where if you don't get it, that means that you think that it doesn't require an unbelievable amount of preparation, an unbelievable amount of tightrope walking. 
What you see every day out of Dan's show is the result of decades in the business, trying to figure out what the audience wants and giving it to them. And you show it with your loyalty to the tune of hours a day. It's why I'm so proud you give me 45 minutes a day. There are millions of people who give Dan four hours a day. I'm your fifth hour and I'm happy to be it. Some people, I'm your first hour and I'm proud of that too. But the opportunity that Metal Arc Media has that it is not fully taking advantage of right now is the growth of the audience because they're so loyal to their existing audience, so loyal to the people who have been with them in Miami since the beginning when they were a land-based radio show wanting to make sure that there's enough local flavor, wanting to make sure that there's Panthers talk and Marlins talk and Dolphins talk and Heat talk and Inter-Miami talk, wanting to make sure that they don't turn their back on who got them where they are. But if you're going to go to a place where you've never been, you've got to not just take the people who are with you, but you got to find more people. And the way to get growth is through expansion. It's through appealing to people who don't care that I was president of the Marlins and that I upset Billy Gill and Mike Ryan and robbed them of their fandom. There's an entire group of hundreds of millions of people who don't give a flying rat's pituitary gland about that. They want to be entertained. What Metal Arc has done by expanding and having an hour on Max every day, by being on DraftKings Network for three hours a day, the growth that they see in their audio world as well, all on YouTube, where they now go live every day at 9 a.m., including Monday to Friday. That has been an opportunity that has been missed that they're beginning to capture. While it's still called the local hour that I appear on every Wednesday, I try very hard to not make it only local. Once in a while, maybe a Marlin story or a Heat story, if I think there's a national slant to it, but I would not call it the local hour. I would actually call it hour one, or I would name it something different. I'm not the creative guy. Coca came up with the name of nothing personal. But I would appeal to everybody, not just around the country, but I want the world. And that's something that I think you're gonna see Metal Arc Media work on. The other thing is when you've got two sides to a business and an office in New York and an office in Miami, communication is critical. And in Metal Arc, the communication between Miami and New York is not as good as it can be. And that is normal. When I worked at Morgan Stanley, I worked in the New York office. There were Morgan Stanley offices in London, all over the world and country. And we had a very hard time having perfect communication between the offices. And there was a feeling when you weren't in New York that you were not on the mothership, that you were missing out on something. And that's the feeling that New York people at Metal Arc have about Miami and the Miami people at Metal Arc have about New York, which is the mothership for Metal Arc. You can't have two. Is it New York? Is it Miami? For me, it's always going to be Miami because the heart and soul of Metal Arc Media is the Dan Lebitard show with Stu Gotts. So one of the ways that it could improve is in communication so that everybody knows what everyone's doing. As I've always said to you, it takes a lot of preparation to look unprepared. And there are no shortcuts to that preparation. In terms of Dan's business acumen, don't be fooled. Dan is one of the smartest people I know. When he says he wants a company with soul, and he puts me as the face of corporate greed and lebitardaf.com and the high prices, which they're not, and the fact that when things don't work well, it's the incompetence of Metal Arc or the incompetence of Samson sucking. Don't misunderestimate what's the bit versus what's the reality. The role that Dan plays as co-founder of the company, he's incredibly involved because he knows exactly what he wants, because he knows exactly what you want. And to know your audience is to know your customer. And that is the single most important thing, other than being well capitalized, it is the single most important thing in any company. K-Y-C. Or as the Cooligans guy would say, K-Y-S, know your supporters. As I would say, know your customers. So Dan does not have a lack of business acumen. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing, clo 4869. Dan is a wolf in sheep's clothing when it comes to business acumen. 
lest you have any other thought. Okay. Uh, Coke, are you worried that we're about to get let go? Is there a concern? Don't worry. I've got your back. What are they going to do? Charge me with smoking? Believe me, there's about eight other platforms, Coke, that want us, so don't you worry. I like giving candor to the audience. All right, so as we head into 2024, one of the things is a sports business podcast, and please go to sportspodcastgroup.com and vote for nothing personal as the best sports business co- uh I'm gonna do that way better, okay? Can you just do a wipe right now, like a break? Do you mind? I guess you do mind. Okay, we'll keep going. Four, eight, whoosh, 69. The Sports Podcast Awards nominations are out and Nothing Personal is nominated in two categories, Best Baseball Podcast and Best Sports Business Podcast. Please go to sportspodcastgroup.com and vote for Nothing Personal in both those categories. I don't want to just be a nominee. We want to win. So please tell your friends, tell your family, vote. Even if you don't like me, vote for me. How's that for a stump pitch? One of the things that I do as part of Nothing Personal is I try to think about what the stories are. So I wanted to talk to you about what I think the top stories to watch in 2024. Here we go. The number one story in 2024, and it's not even close, is the presidential election. Is it going to be Trump v. Biden? Is it gonna be a battle of the octogenarians? Is the country gonna go back to Trump after four years of Biden? Is there a chance that we could have our first woman president if Haley gets the nomination? Is there a chance someone steps in, Mark Cuban, don't think so, and decides they wanna run, last minute? You are gonna hear a lot about the election. You're gonna hear a lot of rhetoric. You're gonna hear a lot of people telling you that America's not good and we've gotta make it great again. You're gonna hear about all the problems that people are having. And in, during the debates, you're gonna hear about issues that presidential candidates have been debating for almost 100 years. At the end of the day, on election day, November, 2024, we are going to be the country that you all want us to be. If you reelect Biden, if you put Trump back in office, you can no longer say you don't know who Trump is or who Biden is. You can no longer complain, everyone is too far left, too far right. We've got the horseshoe. Where's all the people in the middle? We will know our country. So watch the presidential election. It's going to be difficult. It's gonna be trying. There could be some crying, some frustration, but please, no matter what happens, vote. That will be the number one story in 2024. Another story I'm watching, we've talked about it with John Skipper on The Sporting Class, which is another podcast that uh, we do with Pablo. We do it whenever we can and we love doing it. The NBA broadcast negotiations, you're gonna be hearing a lot about it. The NBA is gonna be trying everything they can to get as many bidders as possible to hit the triple that they think they're gonna hit. And you're gonna be seeing what's gonna happen is there going to be a merger between CBS and TNT, or better known as Warner Brothers and Paramount? There was just a rumor that a meeting took place that a merger could happen between those two huge global companies. Of course, Warner Brothers is three times the size of Paramount, but Paramount is like a $12 billion company. These are not schleppers. What does that mean? It means something for broadcast negotiations. It means something for your streaming and the consolidation that I'm quite confident is coming. So one of the stories I'll be watching, in addition to the NBA broadcast negotiations, is what will happen with streaming and consolidation? What mergers will take place? And I don't mean the rebranding of HBO Max to Max. I mean when two companies combine and then what the result is. Because there's only one thing I can promise you about consolidation, it's a guarantee. Next. I'm watching RSN Evolution. Will Amazon take over Diamond? Last year's top sports story for me, Shohei's free agency was number two. My top story was the RSN bankruptcy. It continues to be a big story. NHL, they're keeping their rights. RSN's gonna show NHL games this coming season, but then the rights revert back to NHL. I believe that Diamond is gonna keep showing the baseball teams and then rights will revert digital rights back to MLB at the end of this year. 
They're doing the same with the NBA. That deal's already done. Of course, there's the possibility that Amazon infuses billions of dollars, gets them out of debt, and Diamond pulls a Giuliani, gets out of bankruptcy, and somehow is able to keep running itself as a consortium of networks. But the RSN evolution is going to continue. Cord cutting is not stopping. Subscriber levels are not going up. They will continue to go down in terms of cable. No matter what Skipper says, I do not believe there is an end in sight to the subscribe. Hi, my name's David Sampson. I do not believe there's an end in sight to the continued evolution of those people and how they get their content and the fact that they don't want it through cable bundles. Do you remember when I asked you to keep track of what you're paying for your streaming services versus what you paid with cable if you cut the cord? Do you know that 60% of you are paying more right now? Feels different though, doesn't it? The other thing I'm gonna watch for is Major League Baseball and their innovations because I think they're going to continue. We talked last week about rule changes. That was the same day that Yamamoto signed with the Dodgers. That was part of that show. I don't remember what day. Could have been, I think it was the last live show we did on last Friday. But in any case, did I fool anyone into thinking that that's not where we are? <laughs> That's funny, right? I changed clothes though. For those of you watching on Nothing Personal with David Sampson, continuity, baby, continuity. What were we just talking about? Ah, Rob Manfred and his innovations of the pitch clock, the competition committee deciding to make new rule changes. Guess what? MLB innovations are gonna continue because MLB is not nearly where it wants to be. As long as a regular season NFL game outdraws the World Series, the innovation will not stop. The problem is they're trying to catch a company, NFL, who's also innovating. So are they only innovating in order to keep the distance between, the, between MLB and NFL the same? Or are they trying to make up ground? Clearly it's the latter. And in order to do it, you've gotta be really super innovated. So look for that. And the other story that I'm looking at are the sales of professional franchises, not just here in the US, but everywhere. The numbers have gotten crazy. I like to take credit for getting the Marlins sold at $1.2 billion because I did that deal. And I like to laugh when Forbes has the Marlins worth less today than they were then, all those years ago in 2017, not good. No wonder Jeter won't do a Samson sit down. Will the Nationals get sold? Will the Orioles get sold? Will Man U finally do a deal? What's gonna happen with Bowley and Chelsea? Is he gonna keep spending like a drunken sailor? What's gonna happen in Barcelona? Will they be able to turn their finances around? Will there be a sale of a professional football team that reaches above the commander's six and a half billion dollar number? And was that number even worth it? What's gonna happen with stadiums, football stadiums for Washington? Will the A's move to Vegas? All of these questions will have more answers by December 31st of 24, so I'm watching for that. So those are the stories that I'm watching for in 2024. All right, we're now up to two top tens to end the year. As you know, I love movies and we're entering award season. The Golden Globes are less than, a, I mean, it's a little over a week. I think they're January 7th. Oscar nominations, I keep in my calendar. Coco, we have to talk about that, actually. Oscar nominations happen at 8.30, or maybe 8.15 a.m., and we're live. But I like watching the Oscar nominations. So maybe I'm gonna do some dual screen action. I wanna give you my top 10 movies of 2023. However, this is subject to change. Why? Because there's a bunch of Oscar nominated movies that are gonna come out that I have not seen yet, that as soon as they're available for streaming, or if I have to go to a theater, though I haven't been to a theater since COVID, I will have the movies watched prior to the Academy Awards so I can win my ballot pool again. But this is my current top 10. Number 10, still a Michael J. Fox movie. I'm hoping that movie gets nominated for best documentary. And it's not because of my best friend, Brett Parker and his battle with Parkinson's. It's because the documentary about Michael J. Fox is absolute must see viewing. 
Parkinson's is a brutal, dreadful, horrific disease, and there is no cure. The only thing you can control when you have Parkinson's is how you react to it. And watching Michael J. Fox and getting an insight into how he reacts, very, very powerful. Number nine, a Wes Anderson movie called Asteroid City. Wes Anderson is very quirky, but if you can get through it, there is a lucky charm at the end of the rainbow in that movie. Well worth your time, Asteroid City. Number eight, and I reviewed all these on Nothing Personal, Bank of Dave. Can you imagine starting a small bank in your own hometown to lend money to the people in your hometown and actually making money doing it? And it's a true story. This movie did not get enough attention. Bank of Dave. Number seven, I love musical theater. You know I do. And I'm proud of that fact. Very proud. When I was younger, I wasn't proud of it because I had to pretend that I was this manly man who listened to ACDC when really I wanted to listen and did listen to Air Supply. But that said, theater camp with Ben Platt and Molly Gordon was the seventh best movie I've seen all year. If you like musical theater, and even if you don't, if you've been to camp, even if you haven't, it's a great movie. Number six, Flora and Son. That was with Jesse Buckley. If you recall that movie that I reviewed on Apple TV Plus, please watch that. I don't wanna say any more, but watch it. Number five, Jesus Revolution. Kelsey Grammer in that movie, true story. A guy thought he was Jesus, may have been Jesus. All about religion, baptizing, cults. This is a movie that is a true story based on a true story. And it is compelling, fascinating. And I don't mean like love of one, which was also both as a documentary, but as a movie, I was entertained the entire time. Number four, a movie that I expect to be nominated for best picture, among other nominations, a movie called Past Lives. If you don't know what it's about, just know that there are times when you can reconnect with someone and you wonder, what would that be like? Have you ever said that to a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Hey, in an alternate universe, in another world, we'd be a raging couple. Yes, I have said that. Everybody has said that. Past lives, check it out. Number three, I hate to say it because of Adnan, but Flowers of the Killer Moon is number three on my list right now. It is long and I don't care. Treat it as three one hour movies, watch it. The story of the Osage Indians, the Native Americans. It's a brutal story, brutal. But the movie is done in a way that will teach you because it taught me. Number two, Barbie. It is not a kid's movie. It's gonna be nominated best song, best actress. I, Margot Robbie has a chance. Best picture for sure, best director guaranteed supporting actor for Gosling not out of the question probably guaranteed Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach wrote a screenplay about a doll about Barbie about perfect Barbie with the perfect cast of Margot Robbie and guess what it turns out it's a serious movie and my favorite movie of 2023 so far asterisk is The Holdovers with Paul Giamatti I expect best director, Alexander Payne. I expect best actor, Paul Giamatti. I expect best screenplay, Alexander Payne. Best picture, The Holdovers. Have you ever been with a professor? Have you ever had a relationship with your professor? And I don't mean a nefarious one, like at Horace Mann, where I went to high school. I'm talking about someone who can actually teach you, someone who actually has your best interests in mind, someone who's gruff, tough, angry, yet brilliant. Paul Giamatti in the best performance of his career. And it is my absolute favorite, the best movie of 2023. It's called The Holdovers. And I end this show with my top 10 TV shows of 2023. As you recall, before COVID, I never really watched, actually a little bit before COVID. Actually, it may coincide to, unfortunately, when my marriage ended and I started watching TV shows more and more. And I now realize that there's a quality on TV that is as good and sometimes even better than movies. So I've had to play catch up, but I wanted to give you the top 10 TV shows of 2023. I watched them all in 23 and they were released all in 23. Number 10, Jury Duty with James Marsden. It is, it's gonna get nominated. I think it has been nominated for Golden Globe. It's a movie about a guy in a jury who doesn't realize that he's in the Truman Show. It is 
perfect. Number nine, The Last of Us. Not a zombie guy. Didn't read the book, but I was absolutely encaptured by every single episode. The Last of Us, oh, it's a video game. What did I call it? Did I call it a book? I meant it's a video game. And I had never played the video game and I never read the book. The Last of Us was outstanding. The performance by the young girl who's being nominated, I wanna say her name is Bella Ramsey, but I may be wrong on that. Simply fantastic. Number eight, The Diplomat. Rufus Sewell, remember him in The Diplomat? And the girl, the woman from The Americans, whose name is escaping me right now. I cannot believe this, Coca. I literally cannot. Um, she, she was married to the guy she was in with. Come on, Coca. Let's not end the year with me having a total brain issue. Kerry, her name is Kerry something. Oh, Kerry Russell. I was half right. Number seven, somebody somewhere. Nobody's talking about it. Look it up. Two seasons, somebody somewhere. Number six, beef. Go back to my episode where I reviewed beef. Outstanding. Can two people actually have an experience like in beef? It certainly appears that you can have a beef like that. And the lesson learned in beef is it's better not to have beefs, but to eat beef, except for a month when you're vegan. Number five, I'm sad to say, was the final season of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I am very sad that that series ended. The brilliance of Kevin Pollack, the brilliance of Rachel Brosnahan, the brilliance of, oh God, the guy who played the father. This is live, I'm doing this live. I have no notes in front of me and I just cannot remember the name of that amazing actor who played the father of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And just, he's the whole show. Thank you for those five great years. I will not soon forget it. Number four, what was his name? Tony Shaloub. thank you. Number four, hang in there, Coco, we're almost done. Succession, the final season, enough said. Why is it only number four? Because number three goes to shrinking season one. Bill Lawrence, thumbs up to you and everyone who worked with you to put that show together. Jason Siegel, Harrison Ford, perfect. Every episode, one of the best series you will ever watch. The strike stopped to season two. I believe they're back in the writer's room. How they will have an encore to season one is beyond me, but you know I'll be watching. Number two was season two of The Bear. The episode with Jamie Lee Curtis in season two of The Bear, which was episode six of this season, I believe, was the single best episode of TV or movie that I watched all season long. The Bear season two, did not necessarily have the anxiety of season one, but it had the crisp writing, it had the perfect acting, and it had characters who you looked at and you said, I don't know anyone like that, but I clearly could. It's called The Bear season two. And the number one TV show of 2023, and the last thing that I wanted to talk about this year, before we head into New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, and I'll see you back on January 2nd, is Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso season three, some of you said wasn't good enough. It was more than good enough for me. I have a Ted Lasso Barbie doll just over there that I got for Hanukkah. I have Ted Lasso everywhere in my life because of not Jason Sudeikis, but because of the character that Jason Sudeikis plays. I don't mistake his personal life for his professional life. It's a character that he wrote, that he invented, that he built. When you have run a team for as many years as I had, when you've spent so much time in a locker room, when you've spent so much time studying the human condition and thinking about feelings and trying to make connections, Ted Lasso, as it turned out, was all about fathers and sons. Who would have expected that? Except when you go back and look at all the Easter eggs, where it was a family show from the start, not a soccer show, not a show about being a coach or a guy who's funny with all of his motivational speeches. It's about family, fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and mothers and sons. And when I spend time thinking about my relationships with my mom, my late dad, the people in my life who were like my father, the people who have meant so much to me for 55 years, 
the way I try to be with my children, much to my chagrin that I'm not the father I wanted to be, but I'm trying to be going forward, call back to the New Year's resolutions. There is nothing that is more interesting to me to watch because I watch these movies and TV shows for feeling, for connection. And the connection I had to Ted Lasso was unlike any connection I've had to any show this year, to any movie this year. That's how deep it cut. Ted Lasso season three. Well, that's the mailbag episode. That's the top 10 lists. That's some answers to your questions. We'll do more mailbags next year. Keep those questions coming to davidsampsonpodcast.com. Twitter at David P. Sampson. I wanna thank Matthew Coca. He does this show on his own. All the YouTube shorts that you see, all the TikTok videos, at nothingpersonal.mpds, the Instagram videos, everything that you see producing the show. He is a one man show. Here's what I should have said about Metal Arc Media. We could use some help because Coca is working himself to the bone. Well, Coca, in about 10 seconds, you're about to be able to have a vacation. And I hope that you regroup, regenerate like Deadpool because on January 2nd at 8 a.m., we're going to be back and better than ever. Until then, it's just business. This is nothing personal.